you for, oh, there it goes, kicking it down. I just want to thank you for coming out. And, and I know many of you have asked me questions, and I thought this would just be a good way to run through some quick pictures. And, and I want, at the end, I really want to hear your questions, too. I want to know what you're interested in. But I want to start by thanking you, because I know not only this congregation, but also a lot of people in the community from other churches and other places really gave a lot of support to our guys, and they really appreciate it. It's hard for them. They didn't really have any way outside of email to do anything, but I want you to know they really appreciate it. You, know, you all sent all those millions of cookies, about like 4,000 cookies. Uh, we, we figured that we gave out like 30,000 Jolly Ranchers. 30,000 over the course of the year. And they started being called Holy Ranchers. So, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but I did, first of all, I did really want to thank you, and also to let you know I was away way too long, and I have no desire to go back anytime soon. So, you're, you're, stuck, with me. you're stuck with me for a while, so. Well, let me just start out with Camp Lejeune. You know, first thing we did was we went to our uh, reserve centers. You know, our, I was in New Orleans, and there I had to sign the papers and become officially active duty on May the 17th of last year. And then from there, they flew us up to Camp Lejeune, up in North Carolina, Jacksonville, North Carolina. And that's, of course, a sign you see as you, you went, come into the gate there. And we went there for a lot of different types of training. Whoops, too far there. But you kind of get the idea. Man, it's just going to hit on me. Thanks. Never mind. Anyway, the first one was a building where we were. That's just basically what worked out. The second was the office. You probably saw that. Uh, just with my little pack there and that kind of thing. We had a lot of guys come into us, and we have a candy bowl there, so we draw them in. You're like bees to the honey with a candy bowl, and they come. Even the commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bell, was had a major sweet tooth, so he'd come in there and he'd, he'd kind of reach around the corner, and the RP say, "Sir, if you're going to take those, you got to talk." <laughs> so he'd come in and talk to us. He was a great man, Lieutenant Colonel Bell, down in California. Great man uh, was our leader for all this. Our battalion commanding officer. Now this fellow, this is the guy I want to tell you about anyway, so I'm glad it stopped there. His name is RP1 David Harris. He's a religious program specialist. Those are the enlisted folk who work with chaplains, and God bless him for doing that. He worked with me ever since the very beginning of the workup. And you know, he's always got that look. I like that picture because that's the way he looks, 24-7. And it looks so solid and, you know, so unhappy. But you know what's funny? He is one of the most caring most loving people I've ever known. He would see our Marines had problems. He would dig in, he'd roll up his sleeves, and he'd get busy. Back in the civilian world, you know, we were most of us were reservists. And back in the civilian world, he's a master electrician. And so what he did was he would rewire the many, very rudimentary places where we went. And there were three major places that had electricity and hot water because of him. So he was a fine individual, and I, I was so blessed to have him as my assistant. But that's just the way he always looked. Dark people in Harris. Let's go ahead here. Now, every day at Camp Lejeune, we had formations. They lived in these buildings back in the back there. They'd have certain places where the companies lived, and they would have, you know, gunny sergeants and other that were over them. And once a day, they would form up like this, and that was for accountability. Actually, twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And in the in-between times, we do all kinds of training. That's when we show you some of the stuff. We were there a little over three months. And a lot of times, we take these seven tons and we go out to the field. We do all sorts of different things. Take us out in the middle of nowhere there. And this is, you know that guy on the left. And that's Lance Corporal Steel. And you know what's funny? When I took these pictures, I had no idea who these people were. Because this was at the very beginning. I didn't know them yet. Now I know them like brothers or sons or whatever. So I'm blessed. This Lance Corporal is still a great man. He's one of our office guys. He's not a grunt. Everybody else with you, we were a, we were a uh, infantry battalion, but he's not infantry. He's one of the, the guys who works in the office. But great guy right there, Lance Corporal Steele. And this was us. We were out in the field on this occasion, and we're waiting to ride the Osprey. And what they do is they get you on these lines, and these guys go on these lines. Now, my job when I first got there was to go up and down these lines. And to meet as many Marines as I possibly could. Where are you from? You got a family? Uh, what do you like to do? I mean, my job was to really get to know these guys. And it's so funny, I can name every one of those guys now. But at the beginning, I didn't know who they were. So my job was to walk the line and talk to them. That's what I did. I spent the whole day just walking the line. And the RP would be going ahead of me giving out Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> he would kind of clear the path for 
They loved me by the time they got, I got there. Now you see, this is them gearing up. We're getting ready to go on the Osprey. I just want to point this out because they had a lot of gear they had to wear. Sometimes they would be carrying up to 80 or 90 pounds of gear, if you can imagine. That's including their weapons. You know, if they were a machine gunner, they carried over their shoulders. And what they had there is they had the MTB. That's that very heavy vest. That vest is like 35 pounds with nothing on it. And then they have all their magazine pouches. They've got their water. You see he's got his backpack there, his uh, day pack, they call it. They've got their helmets, their Kevlars, and they wear gloves. So it's a very hot outfit. I mean, we were over there, it's very, very hot. But interestingly enough, people said, how did you deal with the heat in Iraq? Well, when we got over there, it was winter. It was cold. How did you deal with the cold in Iraq is a better question. Now, for this training, though, i got to let you know, this was like in the 90s here at Camp Lejeune. And the next thing I want to show you going into uh, Yucca Valley was 120 plus. So it's a little different. So let's just go ahead here. Now, these are the guys just milling around. This was... This was 90% of their time was spent just kind of milking around, so they got their weapons and all their stuff staged. And that's great for chaplains, because you get to talk to everybody. Now there it was. There was our Osprey that came in, and what we would do is, as a chaplain, it was really cool when you'd see this. They'd say, hey, you know what, chaps? We're going on the Osprey. You want to go? Or, hey, chaps, we're doing water ops. You want to go? And it was wonderful, because I got to do all the fun stuff. <laughs> and, and you know what I learned to do? I learned to not tell the other companies. Because I'd say, hey, you know what, I went on the Osprey. How come you got to go on the Osprey? <laughs> so I learned. I didn't say. I didn't share what I'd done. Because, well, here it is coming in. These things were amazing. So I'll tell you a little bit about them in a minute. But here it comes in. And there we are getting on. So you'd run out of a stick and you'd go get on. Because when we were in Iraq, we rode these. We would fly these. So they wanted the guys to get used to how to get on and you know, get situated with all their gear. So here they are getting on. And there we are, we're going along. I thought it was funny, every time we took a picture of those rotors, are always kind of still like that. I don't know what the effect is of that. But you know, you get you flying these things, you know, you take off like a helicopter, and then you go forward, and then there's a point when you're ready to land that you literally, you're going, you stop in midair, and you're thinking, airplanes don't stop, you know? And what they've done, of course, they've tilted those rotors back up into a helicopter again. So, and this is out the back, they leave the back open. And this is the North Carolina coastline up at Onslow Beach. And this is looking out the back. We took a picture as we were flying along. And they mess with you, too. They do all these banks and turns, and they mess with the Marines, try to get them sick. <laughs> now, see, I told you I got to have fun. It was about 120 degrees, and this is the Zodiac small boat train that we did at Onslow Beach right there on, on Camp Lejeune. And then what they did is they would bring these boats in, they'd turn them around, and they'd practice taking them out, firing up the engines. You know why? Because it was the same boats that we used on the Euphrates when we got over to Iraq. So they had to know how to operate them. And they thought the surf was a, was a good environment because it was high pressure. In fact, I was on it one time and there was a pretty big wave coming. And, and they had a command for get on board. And I almost didn't do it because I thought these guys are going to go over, you know. But I got on. I, was, I, I showed my faith there. I think you know that guy on the left. I got to get wet and have fun. So that was all, that was all good. And you know what? The guys loved that as a chaplain. If you're out there doing everything with them, that was a lot. That's what they love. They want to know you're there for them. Let's go ahead here. That's us going out into the surf. RP took these pictures. He wouldn't get wet, by the way. He didn't do it. This is the range at Stone Bay. Now, you know, Marines are all about being riflemen. They're all about their weapons and their accuracy. And this was the range at Stone Bay. So they, they had that little booth there where they have the uh, fellow called the commands. And that actually moves, it's, it's on wheels, and it moves back for all the different distances that they shoot. And this is what I did. They see, you can see up there the firing line, and then you've got the ready line right behind us, the guys sitting on the ammo cans. And then right behind here are these benches. Well, my job was to go along the benches all day long and talk to these guys. Just like I say, you didn't know them, because at this point I didn't know them very well. But you see, it's a perfect environment. They're just sitting around, they got nothing to do. So you walk along, how you doing, how's your family? And that was really my job. Did a lot of counseling with guys. Okay, now there's yours truly. And this was at that same range. Now this is by the pistol range. You can kind of see it in the background. And what they did is we would make a worship space anywhere. We would just take whatever was available. You see that in the coming photos. Now see, this, the fellow right there in the middle, with his head bowed, was the commanding officer, Lieutenant Cole Bellin. And I appreciated the fact that as we were in the workup, he came to all the services. And I think the fellow saw that. He had a lot of responsibility. You know, going over, we were told, some of you will not come back. That's what we were told. Well, thank God that didn't happen. We brought everybody back.
But he didn't know that. So he, you could see, you could see that picture of the weight on his shoulders of responsibility. And he was also very physical, and he was just like any other Marine. He was not, he was a commanding officer, but he was just like anyone else. Now you see the setup there. What they did is they pulled these benches back from the firing line, and they put them right back here in this little arrangement so I could have a service. You see there's a little picnic table there. And I love this picture of this lone Marine in the back there just kind of, you know, kneeling and coming in to pray. And this was before we went, so they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know what it was going to be like. Okay. Here's, here's a photo of me doing communion. You can see me from the back there. You see, they just took a picnic table. My RP didn't turn it into an altar. But here's something a lot of people don't understand. They said, well, you know, Pastor, how did you do with doing all different religions? How did you do, you know, being doing a Baptist service or basic product? Never did. The only kind of service I ever did was a Lutheran service. Ever. And I was never expected to do anything but, because that's what I am. Now, one thing I did do is I tried to simplify the liturgy, and I tried to preach much shorter sermons that were more impact, because the guys like it tended to have a short uh, attention span. But other than that, everything I did was Lutheran, and we never had a service, not one, without Holy Communion. So, I got to be Lutheran, which somebody said, you know, that's why I couldn't be a chaplain, it's a misunderstanding. You go in as whatever faith you are, but then if there's somebody of another faith, you help them to get what they need and you help them to get to the chapel they need to be with in order to practice the faith. So that's how it works. And this is them coming up for communion. They really, after a while, they really got into this. At first, they weren't so sure about communion. A lot of these were a lot of Baptist fellows. They did not like it. They just didn't know about having it all the time. By the end, they were like asking for it. So, I, I, Well, yeah, that helped also. That helped also. Now, this is something that you all did for me. And, you know, I want to thank Susan Collins for this. And, you know, our Savior, uh, Roman Catholic Church right here in town, gave us a million of these olive wood rosaries from Jerusalem. And this is a, a case of giving the guys what they need to practice their faith. Because a lot of these guys were Roman Catholic, a good number. And so we gave them these beautiful olive wood rosaries that our Savior provided. And I think we gave out close to 100 of them. And that was just a wonderful thing. And we gave out little medals, St. Christopher, St. Michael. They liked that, the warrior angel. And we gave out these beautiful silver ones. We didn't give out cheap ones. We gave very, very nice ones. So they really, this is me just giving them to uh, uh, Gunny, Gunny Smith there. And then this is something that was part of it. You see, he's excited about it. Yeah. Lots of shots. That's lots of shots. You line up all the time for shots. Lots of shots. And the other thing you did while you were waiting is you did a lot of meetings. Because, you know, they had to figure out well, what area we're going to be in, what are we going to do, what kind of supplies we're going to need. So there were meetings all the time. When they weren't in the field, they weren't on the range, they were having meetings. Okay? Now, here we are. We, you notice we changed our outfits here. We're in the desert of digitals now. This, of course, is R.P. Mon Harris having his traditional facial expressions. And he's, he, you know, and he was, you know, I'll say one thing for him. He's my protection. I don't carry any weapons of any kind. So he's the one, and he stays with me. He actually has a protocol of what he does if we get a firefight. And he's highly trained to do that. Well, what I liked about him is he's a crack shot with the rifle. He's good with the pistol. I'm like, I, I like this. This is all right. <laughs> but he was, he was a great man. I'll tell you, he networked with everyone. He loved these Marines and sailors. And by the time I left, I know, I don't think, I know he was more popular than I was. So he was a great man. And so here he is. You see the plane in the back? Uh, we took all commercial planes. This is us getting ready to go to California. We'll see that in a second. And somebody else is ready to go too. Can you pick me out there? One, two, three, four, over. From the left, there I am. I'm talking to our uh, I and I, uh, commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Klein. He's the fellow that stays in the United States and oversees the stuff back here while we're overseas. He's an active duty fellow. But see, there we are, much shorter here at that point. And let's see. We got it. Uh, there's our plane. Now, I don't know why uh, First Sergeant Washington's going the wrong way, but there we are getting ready to go on the plane. He's, he didn't want to go. He was trying to sneak out, but you know what? He was over there, so he could get away with it. Good man, by the way. All right, now we go to 29 Palms. We spent about three and a half months at Camp Lejeune doing all that training. I didn't go into half of it, all kinds of squad training, everything you can imagine. Now we go out to 29 Palms in the Yucca Valley of California. And the reason we went there is it somewhat simulates the atmosphere and environment and temperatures of Iraq. That's why you go there. Uh, and we did a number of things. Now, these things in there are called case bands. 
Um, they're Quonset huts, another word for them. We call them case bands. And the thing to know about these, they've got a door on either end, they're not air conditioned, and they have sand floors. So when you walk through there, the dust is flying, the dirt is flying, the guys cannot keep their gear, gear clean. So that's what they lived in, everybody, including the commanding officer. Now here's, here's the funny part. Here's the funny part. Guess where I lived? I lived in the chapel. That's my room. <laughs> you like, I got the Oreo rug, I got the computer, I got, I was the only person there, the only person in 29 Falls with a real bed. I had a real bed. Beautiful. Now, I gotta tell you one thing though. I, I was in there one time, and we have things in the chapel. You know, we have uh, events in the chapel, you know, briefings and such, because it's a nice big meeting area. And one time, Lieutenant Colonel Bell, the CO, walks in, because he's trying to get out, and you know, I was on the way out. And he walks in, and he's like, What's up with this? And you know, I said to him, I said, Sir, R H I P. Are you familiar with that? Right? has privilege. But I said, Sir, religion has its privileges. <laughs> And he says to me, he says, I don't even have a bed. How do you get a bed? And I'll show you what was most important, though. The coffee pot and the Starbucks. That's what was most important. Right there, see my pictures? Notice my little dogs in the center of all things. Okay, now, this is what it was called, the chapel of the desert. And I guess I was the chaplain of the desert. Kind of neat. It's not like Lawrence of Arabia or something. Okay, now... This is it. This is, you can see my shadow there. I'm taking a picture of it from, from the chow hall. Had a nice little cross in front. That's the only thing that distinguished it from the other case bands. But I don't, you can't really make it out too well, but over to the uh, left of the door, you see a cross. And then this is the inside. You see, on that right side there, if you go over the top, that's my room. That's how it worked. That was my room back in there behind the chancel area. It was actually a very nice, uh, nice chapel. And there's you know who up there with very short hair. You want to start with, and you know, I got very good attendance because we had our whole battalion together at that point. They were in all different area of case bands. So they'd come together on Sunday all over. I had 40, 50, 60 guys. It was great. It was great worship time. And you'll see this next. Now you notice over there, that's Lance Corporal Wilcoxon over there with the guitar. That's the guitar that Ken Green gave to take over. And we used that throughout. And what a blessing that was because they didn't have a guitar in Iraq. They didn't have one for Dan. So that was the guitar we used. And we had fellows that played the piano. These guys were very talented. And they would do some great worship because they knew all these contemporary songs. They play them really well, a lot of feeling. And we had, we had really, all of our music for the most part, church music was contemporary. So that's basically what I did. And there we are. So we're getting ready for service. And here's my gang. That's a terrible picture. I know photographers out here don't like this. But this is our gang right after a service. We just had everybody get together. And let's just take a picture of us by the chapel of the desert. Nice group of guys. Now, I don't know if you remember this fellow. This was Lance Corporal Gaines. And he was the first fellow that we baptized. You see the nice baptismal font. And the pastor came. I was so surprised by that when I got to the chapel. And he was just so excited. And that's about as excited as Marine gets. You see his face? <laughs> they don't smile. I don't know if you know that, but they're not supposed to smile in pictures. But he was beaming. He was so excited. He'd never heard about the grace of God. He said, oh, you mean God loves me? And he, he doesn't, you know... He's not going to condemn me. I said, no, he loves you. He wants to be close to you. And this fellow, God bless him, through the entire deployment, he was in a place called Barwana. Okay, Barwana Expedition of Patrol Base. You'll see it later. Every time I had a service there, he wasn't on post or patrolling. He was at my service. Great guy. All right, now this is, I only put this in here because this is them going out to the field that are 29 palms. This is some range. It's probably a rifle range. But that's what Marines do. You see them lying there? They go over their head, they wait on lines all day long. That's what Marines do. And so what do chaplains do? They walk the lines. Right. They bring around chaplain pictures and such. Now you notice this one. This is just to show you. Look how these guys are huddled in the shade. It was like 120 degrees. It was miserable. You get in the afternoon, you literally could not get comfortable. Even in the shade, you're just you're sweating profusely. You'll see on my bed what, what happens. Okay, this is them just throwing a uh, blue body uh, practice grenade. Here they're doing the mortars. See that for doing mortars? Okay. This, this was funny. This was one of their shirts that they had. All of life's problems can be solved with high explosives. That's a very marine kind of thing to say. <laughs> I used that in my return reunion brief, you know, to show them how to, the water transition brief, to show them how to go home. And I said, that may not be the best philosophy for going back to your home. So, <laughs> so they're, they're great guys. You've got to love them. They're great guys. Now, this was, this was our, our 
our field battalion aid station. This is where the doctor, uh, Lieutenant Commander Will, uh, Wilson was, and they would have all of their corpsmen here. And this is where the chaplain and RP were assigned to hang out when we were on these ranges. We were on range 400 at this point. This is where we hang out. And this is where we live. It's very deluxe, you see. We don't have a roof. We have a little netting, and that's where we live. And I'll show you my, my little rack here. See, there's my rack right there. See, I got my MTV at the end. I've got my extra water over there, my canteens, my pack. And you see up there, I've got my, uh, I've got my uh, uh, sleeping bag rolled up, and I've got a towel on it. And the reason is, if you would lay there in the after, lie there in the afternoon, you would sweat so much, you would soak you wet by the time. And that's just lying there with absolutely nothing in a dry desert. But that's a hot desert. It's unbelievable. You just could not get comfortable. And that's what we did. Even the Marines did that in the afternoon. You could not move or train in the afternoon. You, just could, you did morning and you did evening. So that's what we do. And here they are. God bless them. Heading off up range 400, which is if you're a Marine, that's a very famous range. And they say it's the hardest thing a Marine does outside of combat is range 400. And here's the next picture. These are guys sitting there ready to go. So they got their assignments. They go in sticks like that. New groups of men in a row. Here they are going up Machine Gun Hill. It's just a position. They do live ammo, by the way. All of this is live ammo. So it's a dang pretty dangerous situation. And then here's some guys up on the machine gun. He'll see he's got a spotter, he's got a machine gunner there. And one thing to know too is I ran these with them. I was asked to go out and literally run them. So, and I'll tell you one real quick thing. I got done one day, I was going range 400, and it takes about an hour and a half, two hours to do the evolution, okay? And you're running the whole time. I got done and I had mud on. And I thought, how can I have mud on me? Because it's a desert, and everything's dry, so it doesn't rain, it's sweat. And we all came down with mud all over us. But I'll tell you what, walking down that hill was the coolest thing, because there I was, and there the RP was, right in the middle of what they do. And they appreciate that. Now, one last thing about this. This is the first place that the RP distinguished himself as doing unique things. You know, we have all those jolly ranchers I told you. What he would do, we had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them. He would take the bags, and at the BAS, the Italian A station, they had big things of ice that were brought out to cool the water for the guys. And they were held, you know, kept in coolers. Okay? What he would do is he'd take his jolly ranchers, his holy ranchers, he'd put them between the bags of ice for the whole day. So by the end of the day, they were like little ice cubes. And then he would go and hand them out to the guys as they were ready to get on the trucks and go back home. And he was a hero. A little, little uh, Jolly Rancher, Holy Rancher ice cubes. It was great. Okay, this is my last picture from here. I just thought this looked like something from Moses or something. This was the mountains. See the little rainbow coming up the middle? It just looked like Mount Ararat or something. I just thought of Moses on that one. Or Noah, rather, not Moses. Not, uh, Noah. Okay, now we get to Iraq. We left out of there. March Air Force Base flew over to Iraq. Uh, it was pretty neat. We stopped off in Maine in the middle of 2.30 in the morning. And they had people called troop readers. And these people, most in their 70s or 80s, were standing along the, the, the entrance where we were getting to the uh, airport for the layover. And they're sitting there thanking us and clapping for us. 2.30 in the morning, they're called troop readers. and said, hey, we'll see you on the way back when you come home. And we were very touched by that because they're out there in the middle of the night uh, in Maine. And so we got over. This is the dam. This is Haditha Dam. This was one of the, the, the jewels in Saddam's crowns. He's very proud of this. It's right along the Euphrates River, uh, fairly close to the border with Syria. Not, not real close, but pretty close. And uh, so this is where we were. This is looking actually out of my, out of my room there. And we'll go along here. Oh, the other thing, just to tell you a little about the setup. We served in what's called the Haditha Triad area. It's three cities. Haditha, Haqqalania, and Marijuana. And they're located on various sides of the river and the freight is going down. That was our little area of operation. And within that, we had 22 battalion sites. We had five main sites, what they call FOBs, you know, forward operating bases. And then there were many traffic control points, expeditionary patrol bases. In all, we had 22 sites. And the RP and I, we made it our goal to see each site once a month. So we didn't spend a lot of time here. We spent an average of seven to eight days a month here. And those were two days at a time on the weekend. Because that's when we had to come back. See, I was the damn chaplain. I was. And they, they, they said, oh, where is that damn chaplain? You know, you know, all that stuff. But that's who I was. And of course, I had to have services for the people who were 
frustration there. So on the weekends, I'd come back, and then during the week, we'd go travel. And you'll see more of our travel in a minute. So there's the day. I'll show you a few views of it. This is me looking down from my, my room down on some of the vehicles. These are vehicles they take out for rapid response, quick response force. You know, if there was some problem happening, they'd take these vehicles out, just ready, gas up, ready to go. Okay, this is the spillway right here is what's right above. And then this is looking back where I lived on that wing of, of the dam. See, I lived right in that wing right there. One of those porches is mine. I can't tell you exactly which one. But I was on the fourth deck. I guess you could figure it out. But I was right up there, just a little ways in, probably right in the center there. And that's where I lived. My chapel was right below a few more places down. Every place there had a nice little porch on That was kind of nice. Okay, now this was the ramp. This was, you know, what I just showed you is like to the left. This is a ramp that ran up along the other side. And this is something you could take if you didn't want to take the stairs. Because there were no elevators, by the way. And this is ten stories. So one day I added it up, how many stairs I took. Just in an average day, I did 67 flights of stairs. Because, you know, you've got to go up the 10th deck, down the 7th, down the 4th, down the 1st, back up the 6th. You were just doing steps constantly. Or, everybody hated the ramp. You see, that's seven, seven stories there of ramp up. So everybody hated that. You can see the guy way up there. But that was one thing that we joked about. Now, this is our chapel right outside the Internet Cafe. And you see, obviously, we cross over the door. This is where people would come in. And I'll try to give you a sense of what it was like. I walked in there. There were 15 chairs. I was like, 15 chairs? There's like 300 people that work at the end. How are we going to have 15 chairs? We never needed more than 15 chairs. Because, oh, I know, and that's sad. But people are working, and you know, they're doing it. They just, I had a few faithful people, but for some reason at the end, we never got big crowds for worship. So we had about 15 chairs in there. This was the room. And then this is a typical group of guys from, from a, a Sunday service there. I told the staff sergeant to draw that he hadn't preached. That's why he's standing there. So there they are. That's, that's our gang that we come in on Sunday, Sunday night for service. And this is my office. This is looking from where all those chairs are into my office, okay? And of course, I had two computers. I had a secret computer and an unclassified computer that I could write me something and classify. And you know, she was so good. She'd write me an email almost every day. And that was so encouraging because I would get, I'd come in and there'd be a new email message in the morning. It's, it's exciting. I love this. Appreciate that, honey. <laughs> Now, this is in my office. You know, we're just in there looking back at the computers. It's hard to figure this. But this is looking out. It went out. There was a door there that went out onto this porch that overlooked the dam. You kind of get the concept of it in the computer and then out the door. And then the next one is going to be looking back at the store where you see it's kind of panning around. I wish I had been more organized. See, I didn't know I'd be doing this. So I didn't take these pictures for this purpose or I would have been a little more organized. Sorry about that. But this is where we kept all our story, you know, all the stuff that we gave out to the guys, books, CDs, all that kind of stuff. You notice this is a, this was out in the hallway. This had all kinds of religious resources for the guys. Now these were books, what we called United Through Me. It's a program where the RP would take out a little camera, a little video camera, and it would videotape Marines reading books to the kids. These were all books that we had to choose from. And he'd take another one out on the road, and then they would send these little mini discs home to their kids. We heard great results of how much the kids loved him. I think he did like 136 books while we were there. He did a great job. Always promoting it. Okay, on the road, there we are. There's yours truly on the right. See, I've got my communion kit and my service book and my Bible. And there's the RP. You see what he's got in his hand? The famous Holy Ranchers. He's ready to go. And you notice, doesn't he look, doesn't he look good to go? He looks like he's ready to shoot somebody. <laughs> Okay, now this is a typical convoy. This is guys getting ready. They line up the vehicles. They do a, a convoy brief to talk about what they're going to do, where they're going. Uh, and they, they, they test the guys. Well, what happens if we have a rollover? What happens if we come under attack? They're, every time you go out, they would test the guys. What do you do then? What do you do here? So that when they go out, they know what they're doing. And this is one of those MRAPs. This is a big one. This is a big Cougar MRAP. We hated them. We didn't like to ride them. They had a very bad suspension back and down something down. And we had one guy, we had a, a doc, one of our medical guys, a real tall guy, probably 6263. He sat in the back of the seat, he's this close to the ceiling. Well, we go over bumps, he's in these harnesses that they put in. He's still going, bang, bang, bang. And we all, we were, no, he wasn't bad, but we were just laughing, and he was laughing. Was but, you know, the RP would choose not to go in these because they were so uncomfortable, so cramped. We didn't like these at all. 
So, okay, this is, the only reason I took this is this is typical what it looks like on the side of the road around where we were all on our products. That's, it's just dirt. It's just dirt rocks. And you see the car up there. That car is just pulled over because we went by at that point in time. They had to pull their cars over and get out of the cars and stand next to them whenever we came by. They got really sick of that. And when we left, they changed the policy. Now they only had to pull over to get out of the cars. Now, I don't think that probably is a lot like a civilian Hummer. But that's looking from the back seat where I was up in the steering wheel. You see he's got his weapon there. He's got his M16 there. And that's just looking up. It's just for, for interest's sake, for perspective. There's my RP. Now he's sitting right over here on the right of me. He's in that seat, in the back seat on the right. He's looking up. See, there's a guy in a sling right there. There's a guy who sits in a, in a, he's a turret gunner. He sits in a little hammock type thing. Okay? And then, you know this guy. That's him taking a picture of me. You know, like that. See, I was on the other side. We weren't rolling yet because I don't know how long or anything, so we just take the pictures. See, see, I think you see his blood right up here somewhere on the right hand side. The guy in the hand. Now, this is a sign you saw everywhere complacency kills. And the reason they had these up is because we were in this very peaceful area. But there were IEDs that were off, there were shots fired, and so we didn't want the guys to get really complacent and, and get into trouble. So that was everywhere you went. Now, people in places. I found the Iraqi people to be very delightful, frankly. The ones that I let and talk to were very nice people. They were very hospitable. They give you the last shred of food, the last little bit of water they had. They were very, very nice people. Um, and, and these girls were so cute. We made a point, I know you've seen this picture before, I made a point personally of not treating this like a zoo. I didn't go along snapping pictures of everybody unless I asked them. Now, I didn't take this picture, but they asked these little girls, you mind if we take the picture? They said, no, no, no. And we did it. The point is, you see the mixture there of Western dress and traditional dress? You saw that everywhere. You saw that everywhere. Yeah, sweet little girls. Now this guy, this guy's named Sammy. And for some reason, a lot of their terms are named Sammy. I don't know why that is. You'll see another guy later who, who is Sammy. But this is Sammy, and I met him at Sacron West, was the name of the place here. And I had met with him the time before, and we talked about religion. And he was so happy about that and getting to know me and me getting to know him that he gave me this little uh, little framed picture of Karbala. It's Karbala and Mecca in the center and then Karbala on the outside. And he gave that to me and I was really touched by that because it, it, it's not a fancy thing, it's not gold, but it was fancy to them. Now, I really, really appreciate it. So you can kind of see that on our faces. We're, and I love to see that kind of interaction between the face. I think that was really good. Nice guy. And then here's a guy in his post. I've actually got this picture of me twice for some odd reason. But here's a guy who's post, and this is another thing you're going to see everywhere. Every place had at least four posts, and those posts were manned 24 hours a day. So somebody's up there doing six or eight hours up in the post. Sometimes they had to stand that entire time. And they had these, you know, probably 70, 80 pounds of, of gear on. And we had some back problems because of that. But these are nice guys. See, he's just a nice country boy. He's a great guy. And what we would do is I'd climb up the ladder and I'd go talk to him, just go hang out with him. And that was part of our job when we went to a site. Now, I only took this one because this kind of reminded me of something you might see in Jesus' day. Look at those bullets. Doesn't that kind of look like a throwback? I just thought, man, that looks like Jesus' day or something. That's right on the lake there. Now, another typical road, uh, typical view. You know how in America you see church steeples? Well, here you see minarets. And you see mosques. And you see over there, you can, you can make it out on the right-hand side, there's the blue dome of the mosque. And then there's this minaret right there with it. You know, call to prayer all the time. All the time, Paul. I don't think I ever let a service in the field where I didn't hear the call perfectly. And they always have somebody chanting it. There's always some live person chanting it all the time. All right, now this is one of the most beautiful places. This is Midtown Haditha. And this is right here along the Euphrates. And you see how when you're close to the Euphrates, you've got this wonderful palm groves. I like this next picture even better. You see that? It kind of shows the little village there. You see the truck pulling up. And that just is the Euphrates going down. And along, right along the, the river was very beautiful. There'd be green grass and everything, but you got just a couple hundred meters out, it was just dirt, it was just sand. Okay. Now, this is a fella, he's doing what's called fives and twenty fives. And that means five meters and twenty five meters. He's checking for IEDs. And you don't see them, but there's other guys there too. And they just walk along and they check. And it always made me nervous as all get out. Because what if they happen to step on one? But they were trained to look for them. And they would go out and they check because that was an area we were about to go in. So they'd go out, and we'd actually stop the convoy, they'd get out and do all this, and then we'd go through. 
Now this is a taxi cab. It's something I learned with the, with the orange on the fenders is a taxi cab. And see, these are the people having to get out. See, they had to get out and exit the vehicle when we went by. Now this is what a lot of homes look like. I don't know if that's from the war, I don't know if they were being rebuilt, but they just look like that. You see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes like that. And I never could quite get a sense as to whether that was from the war or whether they were being rebuilt or being built for the first time. They would actually have places, it was kind of like a Home Depot. They would have places that would have those stones and they'd be all piled up in big piles and guys would go and buy stones from those piles and they'd make their home out of them. That wild? Well, no, they would eventually, and that's why I couldn't figure out why they didn't have the roof on. Okay, now this is Walmart. <laughs> See right there, you got your little cover. Now you go in there, and this is, you go in that opening. I wish I moved like a few feet so we catch the guy's face. You go in there, it's very interesting in the shops. There's a guy sitting there usually, and there's a counter with a cash register. All the stuff's behind him. So you've got to ask him for what you want. And we always had to take an interpreter in to ask the fellow for what we need. Or something wanted, we had to ask him. All right, now worship. Just want to say a quick word about worship. My, um, my army was so creative in doing worship, and he really um, would make any environment into a worship environment. You see what he did here? Just notice in this picture, he took that sandbag pile and he put a board over top, and then he put a cloth on top, and he made me a little altar there. You see that with the, with the cup, the chalice, and there's, there's a little uh, path there as well. And he would make me an altar anywhere. So we'll see a little few more pictures of this. There I am, looking serious. And see, that was a typical setup. See, they take like a cooler, turn it over. All those cots would come from their smoking pit. They'd drag them over from the smoking pit. And you know what surprised me? You would think, here's a bunch of young men, 18 to 24, probably average age. They always wanted their first questions when is worship. Chaps, when do we have worship? I said, well, let's, let's ask your gun. Let's find out the best time. When do we have worship is always our first question. There was never a stop I made where I didn't have worship. Never one. Because they always wanted it. We worked it out before we left. We had to have worship service. And you see, that's probably 70% of the guys that are there. So the tennis was very good. Okay, now here's a night service. This is at TCP Jones. And you notice there's a couple of female Marines there. They were called lionesses. And they would work the traffic control points to, to search the women who came through the checkpoint. And they would take them into a special little room and they'd search them there. And that was their role. And so in the evening, they'd get together with the guys. Well, this was a little service we had in the evening before I left. Just to tell you what that's about. Now, this is one of the creative altars that the RV would make. This is made out of two boxes of tissue paper stacked on top of each other. And he covers it. And see, he makes sure it's nice and stable. And then see, he sets the communion up. And I'll tell you about something about that in just a second. There he is actually doing it. And you know something about this fellow? I told him the first time how to do it. And from that moment on, I thought it was with the altar bill here, the altar bill here. Because from that moment on, everything was exactly precisely where I wanted to be. I never once had to move anything. I never once had to change a thing. I just did it exactly perfect every single time. So I really appreciate it. He was a good man. He really was. He is. But he was on this adventure. Here's just me with a couple of guys who came to worship. And here we are on Christmas Eve. And we really had to be creative because we had to use the back of the chow hall. And you notice my, uh, my Christmas candle there is just basically you know, stuck down with some wax. And then I got my, my really fancy baptismal font, my salad bowl baptismal font. <laughs> and there's uh, Sergeant Thomas. He was so excited about being baptized. He's one of the other guys we baptized. And I think he actually smiles in one of these pictures. He'd get in trouble for that. Oh, we don't have any of it. But here's me doing communion, like I said, we always did communion in our fashion. And there's Staff Sergeant Peralta. We got really close over this year. You see, look on his face. I just love this picture. Because that's two people that, that you know, they, they like each other. They respect each other. Okay, now here we go. Here's, uh, here's Christmas Eve. I know you've seen this picture. This was the one moment over there when I really felt like I was home. Singing Silent Night with the candles. And I almost forgot I was in Iraq. It was wonderful. Okay. Now, this is Easter sunrise service. This is up on a little landing up on the sixth deck. Of the, of the dam. See, there's that little, that little steps going up, go to that ramp, that horrible ramp that went down. And we gathered, this was the first thing in the morning, and unfortunately it was kind of a cloudy morning. The morning before it made gorgeous, but you know, you know how that works. Okay, there I am, leading my small congregation on Easter. And I want you to notice something. See that table back there? There's a cloth on it. That is the RP's bed sheet. 
And you know what he did? He took it and he duct taped it so that it would fit that shape because he couldn't find anything to cover the table with. Man, that guy was incredible. He was just amazing. I hope it wasn't dirty. I don't think. <laughs> now, there's some guys. These are guys faithful throughout the whole experience right there. That's us on that deck. Okay, creative cooking. Now, I know you can't see this, but there is, that's a whole group of sandbags there. And there's a little pit in the middle with a little bit of HESCO wire on top. It's the HESCO barriers, if you know what those are. They're, they're, thing that, they're empty, but you fill them with sand and dirt, and that's what makes the barrier. Well, they, they come with a grate and then burlap. Well, they would take the burlap off the grate and they cut it into a grill, and they make a grill out of it. So that's, they had to be very creative with their cooking. They had all the food in the world, but they had no way to cook it. So they're very creative with their cooking. Yep, and you remember this guy. This is our baptismal guy. There he is in Barwana. He would be cooking on a half barrel grill, which was very popular. The art who made those, by the way. He was the guys that came out to him. And here they are enjoying his, his uh, goodies. And notice there's a dog there. That's Whitey. Whitey would go out on patrol with all of the guys. Keep them safe. And you notice his grill tool that he's using there? It's his paw. They would turn all the meat with their hands and stuff. It was really wild. It was crazy. And he's got a little, my wife pointed out, he's got the tongs right there. They would use their hands. they turn everything with their hands. Very, I got a story for you, a real quick story. I, might really late. I got a really quick story for you. I went to one place, and a little place called a Loose. And there was a fellow who was a chef in New Orleans. That's what he did on the outside. He was a chef in New Orleans. That's one of our sites. <laughs> And he got local garlic and local onions, because we didn't get a lot of seasonings. And he had the, they had this chopping board, which they would just pour water on. They'd pour bottled water on it to, to clean it. And he got done chopping up the garlic, and he put it in a half bottle. And they'd take the water bottles, cut them in half, and that was their container for everything, you know. And he put them in there. I told Lisa the garlic was black. It was black from his hands and from the, from the, uh, from the board. But I'll tell you what, though, that was a delicious stew. It took like chunks of meat that was out of this world. And you know, the best part was you ate it over rice. And all day, it simmered it all day long. You ate it over rice, it's one of you take a bite, and then the heat hit you. That was beautiful. <laughs> oh, well, they had tons of steak. They got big cases of steak. Everybody had steak. And they would bring these things out. They, this guy just cut it into cubes. It was uh, uh, like uh, Delmonico steaks. They cut them into cubes. And he just used that as the base for this uh, stew that he made. Okay, here's a real cook right here. This is uh, Corporal Kelly in his kitchen. You see, that's a kitchen in Aquamia. And see, they got these little containers. The guy would come in, the food would be in those green containers. They'd go along and take what they wanted. And he'd serve it up to them, actually. All right, now this is the stuff that we set up. They can come at any time. They can microwave something, you know, if they're on duty or whatever. They got a little case and cookies and fruit over there. They got chips and, and all kinds of other stuff the guys can eat. And here's the grill masters. You know, these guys got really good at grilling because they didn't have any other choice, so they had to grill everything. And here, this is, I think his name was Sergeant Ortiz, and there he is. I didn't know him real well, but he's, he had marinated these ribs for three days, and he's putting the final touches on them. He was going to give them to the chaps. That's what he was going to do. And you see, a very satisfied customer. And that's another interpreter named Sammy. And he wants to come to America and ride Harleys. That was his vision. <laughs> now, this was something you would get at the dam. It's hard to make out. That's two big lobster tails. Shrimp over on that side, mashed potatoes. They have a nice salad when you're at the dam. I was only there on the weekends. But on the weekends is when they had the fancy food. Saturday night was king crab legs. You get two of them. Fried shrimp. I told my family I can't stand the looking fried shrimp. I've had so much of them. And the light was tough over there. We just put that back. Fried scallops. Okay, morale boosters. Like I told you, 30,000, 30,000 Holy Ranchers is what we figured. And this is stuff you guys sent us, by the way. Thank you very much. This is when all the boxes came in. We put it all together for the RP. This was the RP's box. And he went through every single one that we had. Every single one was given. Now, this is when we came into the office one time. This is what I came to find. The RP and his little elves had brought these down seven decks. Seven flights of stairs to bring all these 60 boxes down to our chapel. So, but I we really appreciate it. This was all the cookies and everything was fabulous. Okay, now this, talk about morale boosters. These show guys loved chess. Now, isn't that strange? I didn't really expect that. But and they, at least three of them cleaned my clock. I used to think I was good chess, but they cleaned my clock. They just, 
They haven't checkmated just a few They're good. And here's what they did. Those are all different kinds of munitions. <laughs> they're all from they're all from munitions. They're all from like shells. They're all from like different types of shells. And they use them with the chess pieces. So in this game, you don't want to take it and kind of knock the other piece off the board. You don't want to do that. <laughs> but I thought that was very great. They built the board and they built, they, they designed all the pieces. I thought that was pretty cool. Go boost morale. And then what put boost morale more than a dog, right? This is Bees, and Renee knows. This is Bees. This was the cutest little dog in the world. He was at Coffee they called it Coffee Shop. He was at Coffee Cute little guy. They come back to patrol, they play with him and rub him. It was the best thing from around the world. This guy's name is Oreo. Can you tell why? <laughs> this was Oreo. And he was, I think, Saffron West, I told you about before. Maybe South Down Village. And then this guy, this is my favorite guy. His name is Golub. <laughs> and that's Arabic for dump truck. <laughs> and that is what that is what the interpreter's name is. Golub, the dump truck. <laughs> Just a little puppy, little that guy. Oh, and there's my morale booster right there. I got that picture, that's very nice. That boosted my mind a lot. Okay, now, I want to show you this. We don't have a whole lot more left, but I want to show you this. I want to run through this dust coat. I want you to watch closely. The best thing to watch is over here on the left, you're going to see power, power, uh, it's not really power poles, it's like power, uh, towers or whatever. Thank you, Margaret. And she's always looking out for But watch the dust overwhelm them and just see how dark. This is the middle of the day, by the way. Okay, the middle of the day. Watch this. I'm just going to run through it. Okay, just watch the dust advance. Watch this. Watch this. These are guys on the dust storm, and that's the end result. I'm not kidding. It would literally become night. And you know what? I had a very well sealed room with the name. I had a very nice room with the name, actually. The TV, air conditioning, the whole thing. I wasn't there very much, but I had a nice room. Those doors were sealed pretty well. I go back there would be a thin layer of dust on everything. Even with the sealed doors, because this was so invasive. This was just that real thin, real, it's like it's like tan talcum powder. Is what it's like you can imagine. So there it is. And then I gotta tell you about this. One time when I was in the city of Abu Hyatt, we had a dust storm that was orange, like orange tang. There's nothing, this is the same camera, no change in lens. Take a look at this, orange. No kidding, that's exactly what it looked like. And that, that tank, see that tank back there? That's only about maybe 100 yards away. Now watch this. There's some guys, unfortunately, having to be out there. There I am. This is uh, the one from the trackers. I was down there with them. That's the actual color of the sky there. And then this is a doorway. And there was this really weird orange glow because you know, outside there was light and we had all this dust. And I just think that looked like something out of a science fiction movie or something. Okay, daily life. See these guys just sitting around. They're just sitting around there. They have a table. They have all the little. See, they got their computer set up, their speakers, and listen to some music. They got a microwave over there. That's the only thing they can cook with outside of the grill. And there they are, just hanging out during the day. Here's a guy who's cooking some rice over on the fire in the corner there. And this, I, I apologize for this picture, but I didn't have any pictures of a smoking pit. They call that science is purgatory, by the way. And that's the RP sitting there, and they're, they're sitting on redneck climbers. You know what those are? Those are pallets that are made into, into recliners. Those are redneck recliners. <laughs> now this is the RP. He's in the back of the seven ton. We just sit there along a long old bench. And then we travel with the seven tons a lot. I don't get a lot of this on there. But that's, that's him. And it was cold. You can see he's got his neck gator on. And he's got all of his winter gator on. This is just an average courtyard. It just was nasty. This is at one of the sites. This just shows you the setups. And those are Hesco there. See those things that are sitting there? They look like little... Those are Hesco that are filled with sand and, and rock. And those are posts. Those are where the guys stand post and look for intruders and so forth. Oh, there we go. Guys just hanging out. There's that moon dust. See the foot? It would sink right all the way up to your laces and that stuff. Very thick. And there's the gym. Guys, that's what they did. They didn't have anything going on in every place. They rigged these really creative gyms. Now, water everywhere. Huge pallets filled with water everywhere you went. Because you couldn't drink the water. It was great water. Like we have here the Blue Arrow Lawns, we have covered the beach. It was great water. It was disinfected, but they didn't take any other garbage out of it. And so I brushed my teeth with bottled water for six and a half months. 
Oh, and this was the worst thing. I told you about this. Was the smell in the air. They burned their trash. They had trash pits like this. They would burn plastics. They would burn batteries. They would burn anything you can think of. And it would make the air rancid smell all the time. It was horrible. That was the worst part. That really was the worst part of it. And then there's a post. So they got the ladder going up. And yours truly would scamper up that ladder. And he talked to this guy. We've seen this picture before. Nice guys. And that's where you get some of the best conversations because they have nothing else to do. So sit there and talk to you for a half an hour. Now see these guys, look what they're doing. They're just sitting around. They're on HESCO. See, that's a HESCO floor. They use that for the grill as well. But they're just sitting there. See on the cots? And they got the redneck recliners there. And they're just hanging out. That's all they're doing. Just hanging out. There's their little outhouses. All, all human waste had to be burned. So that wasn't a lot of fun. And jet fuel. <laughs> and here's some guys see the RP hanging around with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Okay. Coming home, here it is. Line up, see the line up there at the bottom of the dam. There we are, getting our seven tons ready to get the heck out. We had to do an inspection, we had to lay out all our gear. They went through everything. We had dogs come sniff it. I don't know what we were trying to do, but they had dogs come sniff all my gear. And then here we were in Kuwait. We had these places. The only thing to do all day was sleep, so that's exactly what these guys did. They would eat and then go sleep. And they'd eat and they'd go sleep all day long. And there's our HS commanding officer right across from me. He's, he's kind of relaxed. He probably doesn't appreciate that picture. And there we are. See that the guys are loading up the sea bags on the truck, see back in the front there, and then there's a bus that's going to take us to the airport. Now, when we got there, we had to go through a special thing where they make you unpack literally. You didn't have to pack everything in. You don't pack everything you have, every down to the very smallest item. And then you'd go to these big tables here, and you'd pack everything back up. It took over an hour, because you had to unpack everything. You had to inspect everything you're taking out of the country. And then this is what we like to see, right there. Expediting the heroes home. We saw that, we got them and guess what? The rest is history. And that's really all I've got. So I was wondering if you guys have any questions of me, anything that, that you wanted to ask, anything I didn't know. Sorry I know this was a little longer than I thought it would, but um, yeah. That's a very good question. Thanks, Jake. He said, how many outposts in a day? What we did is we went for a week. We would go be with weapons company. Let's just say we had four companies in h &S. We would go to weapons company. All right? They were in Pakulian. So we'd go and see them. And then they had a number. They had a traffic control point. They had a couple expeditionary patrol bases. And then they had their main father. And when we went out on Monday, we would go and have service with those guys in the evening. The next morning, we'd get on the log train going out to the EPB. We'd be with those guys all day and have service. That night, we'd be taken back to the main flaw. Maybe have another service there, because there's a lot of guys. The next morning, we'd go out to the TCP, and we'd spend the week that way and come back on Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday, we're back at the dam, and then Monday, we went out to go see Lima come. And we did that the entire time. And I'm proud to say that we saw every position at least once a month. So we saw each one at least six times. And I'm very proud of that, because that that, we figured it was 208 convoys, 208 times that we went out on the road with these guys. And, and we're, well, RP and I, we came out really proud of that because we felt like we knew what we were supposed to do. So, to answer your question, maybe one, maybe two places in the day. That can happen every once in a while. Yeah. Was there anything different in your sermons having the camera? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't follow the pericopies. You know, we have the pericopies that we follow. And we have set lessons. I didn't do that. I chose the lessons based on what I felt the needs were. If they were lonely, I'd pick it on that. If they were tired, I'd pick it on that. I tried to make the sermons very short. I tried to use illustrations. I, I never used notes because I was just down them like this because if you did, you lost them. And maybe that's a lesson for you know, us in the regular church. But the point was I had to do that. So to answer your question, they were also shorter. Never more than 10 minutes, maybe 5 to 8 minutes. I know we had somebody have a question over here. Just does storms. I never heard of it. They probably have a local name for it, but I mean, we just called them dust storms because that's exactly what it was. And they were towering. They coming over you. It was, you've got to be inside. You have to be. Yeah. Uh, questions in the press. Yeah. job of pacifying, and it cost many lives to do that. But the Marines have done a good job of pacifying and getting rid of a lot of the bad elements. So for us, it was basically just keeping the peace. We were more like peacekeepers, frankly. That's just the honest truth. So it's hard for me to speak to like Baghdad. I don't know what that would be like. But for us, we were peacekeepers. 
And we worked with the Iraqis to train them. One of our jobs was to train the police and to train the army to do the job. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I thought the morale was pretty good for our guys because they saw that the Iraqis were rising. They really did. From the time we got there to the time we left, the Iraqi army and Iraqi police were much better at what they did. When we got there, we were like, why are we messing with this? They don't even get out of bed anymore. By the time we left, they were on patrols we didn't even know about. So they did a really great job of standing up. Where did the surge relate to when you got We weren't really related to the surge. I think that was more Baghdad. We were, we were pretty much we were replacing a unit that was already there. I mean, we really basically came into the one for one, what they call it, relieving the place. Well, I think what helped was we, we were keeping them safe. And they were very positive towards us. I think if they were having a lot of violence and the kids were getting hurt, and I think it would have been different. But we had a pretty good report. I think that helped us in our area, our little teeny slice of all of our province. It was just one, it was like two minutes in the river, that was our area. So I can't speak to more than that, Jack. But I think for our guys, when I was pretty good, because they saw improvement happen. Yes, Pat. Well, that's a good question. Up on the 10th deck, up on the very top, there was a battalion aid station, just like we had it in June, just like we had it in the Yucca Valley. It was up there. They had stretchers. They had all the latest medicine. We had a uh, very well-known hypertensive specialist, uh, Captain John Nadeau, was our surgeon, our battalion surgeon. We also had an ER doctor, being Lieutenant Commander Wilson, who was actually ran an ER in Mississippi. And he came in, and we thought, boy, if we get an action, he's going to be the man we want to have. So we were very well-equipped. And they would see people, and if there was a serious problem happening, they'd send them on to Al-Assad. They'd send them back to the big hospital. But they could handle the cuts and scrapes. And, and I got sick one time eating Iraqi food. I ate something called moolah. And it made me sick to where I had to have two bags of fluid that I spent all day in the Italian aid station. So they worked on me. They helped me. But I got very sick. Yes, Rachel. Well, you know, they really, she was asking if there was any danger. There really was all the time. Because you remember that, that sandstorm that was orange, like orange tang? Once that, the star guys didn't go out, they stayed in. And when they went back out, because they go out, they clear the roads, there were like three IEDs that had been put in during the orange sandstorm. So they knew that we weren't moving, and they put in, what's well, so if it's a bomb, and they put the road that could blow up and hurt a car or hurt people? Well, the good news is, the good news is, we only had one that went off, and it missed the vehicle. It did give the fellows inside concussions, but nothing that they had to be hospitalized for. So that was, that was good news. It was kind of like getting knocked out. But they were fine. But yes, there was danger, but thanks be to God that nobody got hurt. At least that's the best news. And I never told my mom how much I was on the road. That would not be good. Yeah, I noticed the uh, bus for a lot of guys were uh, type of mask. Did anybody get sick, sick from breathing? You had dust in the well, what we heard at the end, Greg, we heard at the end is that in, in our outbrief was that there's been no proof that that, that dust necessarily, uh, that the amount of exposure we would have to would cause medical risk. That's what we were told. I don't know if that's true. That's what we were told. Uh, you just try to stay out of it. I mean, there were times I would, I'd be riding back in the summertime and you could just see the air, which is a weird experience. I mean, the air was visible around me, swirling this way and that way. And that was the dust that would kick up in our trucks. So, I, I think I'm more worried about the burning trash than the front, because that was an awful smell. It was all, I'd say, 80% of the time it smelled. So you had to go inside. And once you got inside, air conditioners took care of it. But you see, we didn't, I didn't get to be inside too much. So that's the only one I'm a little bit concerned about. Yeah. Did you have a physical exam when you checked out? Absolutely, we did. We went through a very thorough physical exam we checked out. And they asked us a whole battery of questions about how we were doing our back, doing our knees. Have any symptoms. So they ask you, and if you were honest and they catch it, the VA will cover that. So they really encourage you guys, please don't fudge. Please tell us if you're having a hurting back, let us know. And, and they were, it sounded pretty good. You know, you don't know sometimes between the words and the actions. It sounded like they were pretty good care of the guys that did have that cross. We did have some guys who were at MTV and going on patrol, standing in those posts for hours and hours that did have some back problems. And I'm hopeful that they're getting home. Any other things come to mind for you? Yes, or that is a good question. That is a good question. I, you know, that's you know, RHIP in the sense of rank. Because if you were, what was it? If you were an E6 or above, you could use a little washer and dryer on the fifth deck. Okay, and they had keys. You couldn't get the key unless you were that rank. And 
And I would go in and I'd wash my clothes, I'd buy the detergent, the, the PX up the dam, I'd put my little dryer sheet in there so I smelled sweet, you know. <laughs> I mean, I had it easy. Now, now I'll tell you what was bad, but if you weren't E6 and above, you had to take it down to an industrial laundry. And they, okay, the washers were fine, they were these big, huge washers, but the dryers were run on diesel. And so, and so the clothes, because I did it one time, the clothes would smell like diesel. And so I felt bad for the guys. But that's one place where rain had to I just go up when I was there on the weekend and I'd do a load. That's how I do it. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I'll tell you a funny, somewhat chicken story. Our guys wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner. They were at a place called Sinjik, which was near Barwana, I think it was. It was one of the EPs. And they wanted to have turkey for Thanksgiving. And so they went out and bought a local turkey. And you got to understand Marines. They had more fun slaughtering that turkey. I'm sorry to say that. But Marines, they just, you got to understand Marines. But here's the thing. They ended up cleaning it, picking the feathers off and everything like that, and cooking it. And it, I didn't say anything to them. But it was really like a chewy, nasty taking. Like a medium-sized uh, medium chicken. And it was very, it didn't taste good at all. But they tried. They tried. Yes, I bought all kinds of souvenirs, but I think looking back, we were probably the wrong kind of souvenirs. I mean, just to admit, things people really didn't want. I brought a little rug with the Rocky Freedom on it, and this stuff that, you know, who really wants that? But I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do some, you know, that's a good thing, Rachel, I'll tell you what I'll do one day, and I thought about this tonight. I'll bring that stuff in and put it on the table, and you can look at it, okay? All the stuff I brought that, like headdresses and stuff like that, okay? Cool. <laughs> Well, that was, the Sacramento wine, well, I mean, it was treated, I mean, we thought it was like National Treasure or something. They brought it in. They brought it in under guard, okay? It was blown in under guard, and it was placed in a locked box that I had the key to. That's where the Sacramento wine was. And I was the only one who could get to it. So if, if any was missing, they knew who could come and get. Because uh, that, I was the only one that had access. But uh, that's how we, that was the only alcohol available there. The only exception was on the Marine Corps birthday, they gave the guys two beers on the Marine Corps birthday. And on the way home, they were so downhearted. You know, Marines love their beer, let's just be honest, 90% of them do. And they said, oh, you're going to get two Heinekens on the way home. And they went, yeah. And then we got on the plane, and then, you know, a V8 can? That was about the size of these Heinekens. And they were like, oh. They were very, they were very discouraged by that. They were, very, they were like this big. They were very discouraged by that. But no, they were they were very good guys. Any other any other thoughts? Anything else that comes out of the cover comes to mind for you? Yes, Al. Well, you know, that's a very good question. You asked about suicides. And for our Marines, I think what would cause that out uh, is the fact that these guys are away from home and it was just horrible. They would have their wives and girlfriends cheat on them and leave them and they get these dear John letters, and I'd have to be there when they're emails, actually, and I'd have to be there when they got it, they'd be crying, and that's just a, that's just an inconsolable feeling, because they didn't have anybody to turn to now, and some of these guys, this was really heartbreaking, I knew one fellow, high-ranking fellow, with two beautiful young children, showing him pictures, his wife had actually moved in with another man, and had told him, when you get home, don't, don't come home, you can't come home, so now he has to go and find an apartment somewhere and go through a divorce after he's been separated from so that poor fellow, we spent many hours talking. So to answer your question, I think that was most of it, was breakups and, from girlfriends and marital situations and stuff like that. I think that was mainly what would cause of suicides. And we did talk to him. We tried to make him feel a little better. Yeah, Joe. Some had. Well, and some got married right before the deployment. Some got married to the deployment. You know what I mean? They said, in case you die or whatever, I'll give you your benefits. And I don't think it was that cold. But it was like, hey, I, I love you all. I'll make sure you get my death benefit. And some of those, they didn't think it through very well. And a lot of these girls were so young, some were like 17, 18 years old. And they want to go out and party. They want to go out and, and, and live it up. Let's face it, they're 18 years old. And they just couldn't be shackled by having their man away for a year. So it was tough. And I'm not, I'm not giving them excuses, but I think at that age, it's kind of easy to understand how it's all. 